I can't stress enough if uh, it, as an entrepreneur, uh, I'd call that the next rung in the entrepreneur ladder, right? It's building a business so forth, but just really start thinking, what if you could grow by a whole company tomorrow? Just think about that, right? What if you could double your company with one transaction? Start thinking that way, you know? So, but yeah, I got a few things in the pipeline that I'm excited about. Thomas Green here with Ethical Marketing Service. On the episode today, we have Khalil Stoltz. Khalil, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Thomas. It is my pleasure. Would you like to take a moment and tell the audience a bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, I'm a growth strategist and consultant. Um, I help companies uh, drive rapid, effective growth. Um, I'm also a business investor. Um, acquiring software and um, in sales tech companies as well. So, um, I, in other words, I wear a few hats, right? Like most entrepreneurs do, right? But um, so that's high level what I do. Um, uh, my background came from B two B sales, um, cold calling, as well as sales training, um, and I've since kind of rolled up a lot of those expertise to uh, to help others uh, through their entrepreneurial journey. Thank you for the introduction. Of the things that you mentioned, because there are so many things I can ask you about, what is um, the thing which you find to be the most interesting for you or perhaps your passion? Uh, great question. Um, I would have to say for sure acquisitions uh, and strategic mergers. Um, I found that to be the most lean, effective way to grow. Um, in other words, you know, most of us think of growth in incremental steps. Right. How can I just grow only through marketing, which, hey, I own a digital marketing company, so I love the value of marketing. Right. Um, but most of us are focused on growing one customer at a time. Right. How can we transition to grow exponentially or in bulk? Right. Because growing company at a time is a lot more fun. <laughs> right. Um, but in essence, even without acquisitions, but strategic partnerships, joint venture alliances, power partnering. Right. Uh, imagine if you could grow through gaining access through the customer lists of others, the media channels of others, et cetera. Those are the things that drive massive windfalls of profits for your business and operations. And ironically, with less effort and work. So by far for me, it's uh, I love finding the creative, unusual way to attain particular goals. Um, that, uh, that requires less effort and time to achieve them. Right. So by far, that would be my, my most favorite thing to, I typically focus on. I have heard, um, you know, in relation to acquisitions, like it can take decades to build up a, a business and, you know, you can almost leverage that, that time in a very short amount of time. Um, but I think that in terms of the, the example you used of, you know, getting one customer, that's, that's quite clear in people's minds. But with the acquisition, uh, I think the perception is it's much more complex, much more difficult to do. So what do you think about that perception? Great question. Uh, I like to tell people it's just what you're exposed to at the end of the day. Because we're exposed to sales and marketing, right? That's what most entrepreneurs are used to. It becomes familiar to them. Right. Same way that at one point it may not have been familiar and they push to make it familiar to become proficient, right, to grow their business. Likewise, you'll find that, you know, once you start to expose yourself to it and get out there and try it, um, you get a lot of feedback that will drive, you know, your understanding concerning the topic. And you most likely will actually find once you expose yourself to it that it's a lot more simplistic <laughs> in many ways, um, you know, uh, to do that right? When you understand, and a lot of the mechanics are actually similar, right? To get a customer, you have to understand your value proposition. You have to understand the customer, what their needs are, what their pain points are, what their desired reality is that they're trying to achieve, right? And typically your solution, you believe as an entrepreneur, is the bridge to bridge that gap. Likewise, when it comes to a strategic merger or a joint venture partnership or an acquisition, a lot of those principles are very similar. You're dealing with typically another business owner who has goals, needs, desires, pain points, and you potentially partnering with your solutions that you've developed in your own operations could be the answer to their problem, right? 
So you'll often find a lot, uh, a lot of times those sales components are very similar. Interesting. Have you, do you help people with acquisitions or uh, do you sort of, are you referring to acquisitions that you've done yourself? Yep. Uh, so both, right. Both. And so I do also help others guide others through that process um, through s structuring strategic joint venture alliances. Right. So what I would like to call a soft merger, right. As well as how to go about strategic acquisitions and, you know, higher skill mergers. So I do coach people through those processes um, and, you know, those ways to drive rapid growth. And you got some favorite examples to share with us? Oh, yeah, uh, I've got quite a few. Um, uh, I'll kind of funny enough, it kind of how that started, if you will, was actually throughout my corporate career, I was in transportation and logistics. Um, and uh, we were cold calling, I was cold calling 150 calls a day for about three and a half years, right? I was successful at it, right? I also became a sales trainer, top performer, all that sort of stuff, right? So, uh, but one thing that makes uh, corporate B2B sales um, very competitive is not just external competition, it's internal, right? So you're competing with hundreds of other brokers and sales reps, uh, and the systems are such to where only one person is allowed to prospect a particular company at a time, right? So Amazon's already taken, UPS is already taken, you know, all these major companies that would normally come to mind, right, already spoken for <laughs> in the, in our internal CRM. So I had to get creative. I was like, okay, how can I land the big, you know, the big fish, if you will, the whales, as we like to call them in sales, right? How can I land them most consistently? So I got to thinking, I was like, you know what? What if these people who we think are our competitors, what if I could just provide our solutions to them because they already have those accounts that I want access to? And it clicked for me. And that ironically was easier for me than trying to close these larger scale accounts. Because those types of accounts that you pursue uh, could take upwards of two years to close. I kid you not, right? So I was getting, you know, in how I was framing it to these quote unquote competitors, like, look, we have the best fulfillment, you know, systems out there when it comes to finding truck drivers and so forth. I can help you set, you know, keep the customers happy. You just keep focused on getting more of those customers, right? Those large scale customers. And I got access to major enterprises like Walmart, Trader Joe's, et cetera, to run their transportation in various forms of fashion by strategically partnering so that's where it started for me um if you will now applying that in my business you know an entrepreneurial journey um i also own a digital a b2b digital marketing firm um and applying those same strategies we grew 240 percent in four months right so rapid aggressive growth um from just joint venture relationships right and what i did there was i targeted other prospecting and marketing companies that didn't have the particular, you know, arm of our solutions in their wheelhouse and plugged it in as a solution. So I integrated, right? In other words, you know, we talk about building a pipeline. My mindset was, how can I just kind of get some water from a pipeline that's already built, right? How can I just, you know, kind of smoothly interject there? Uh, and then you just jump right in down, you know, flowing downstream with less effort. So, and that's what happened, right? I was for lack of better terms, interjecting myself into systems and processes that were already flowing, that I didn't have to rebuild or recreate or manage even, right? Um, so those are just a few examples, just from my own experiences that have made massive, you know, changes positively for us, just by, you know, looking at pipelines that are already established. So that last example, was that a, that was a joint venture or was that where that was you a joint venture. someone? Okay. Yeah, that was a joint venture. Mm -hmm. And um, the the ones where, say, acquisitions, um, mm -hmm. what sort of time frame would you say are on those? In terms of finding something, negotiating, acquiring, you're saying that kind of uh, pipeline, if you will. So this can vary, right? Um, you can have some as quickly as 30 to 45 days, right? Just dependent on motivation. Right. And again, this goes back to kind of a similar something I mentioned earlier. The sales processes are very similar between getting clients and getting a company. Very similar, depending on how motivated someone is. And that's a part of your sales process. You uncovering motivation, what their needs are, et cetera. Right. How you go about sourcing them. That's that marketing component. Both are very similar in both regards. Um, you could have something as quick 
that's 30 days. If you have something that takes as long as four to six months, right? Just depending on some of those factors, right? But when you understand- Whether, that, uh -huh. Do they come to you or do you go to them? Mix of both, right? I believe in a two-pronged approach. Um, I eat my own cooking. So, you know, A, first thing I do is I look for circles of influences, right? That already have my target acquisitions attention, right? And that could come in various forms, right? Could be CPAs. It could be other marketing folks that serve my ideal acquisition target, right? For off-market opportunities. Um, so those are some ones where they're now sent to me. Hey, you need to go talk to Khalil, right? Because I've given my circle of influence key criteria on who I serve and in what scenarios I can help them. So when it comes up for them, they see it and say, okay, yeah, you need to go talk to Khalil, right? Um, so those are some examples, right? So it's a both and process um, of direct outreach to my targets, as well as utilizing circles of influences, strategic partners to drive opportunity. The funny thing is, I want to hear what your answer is, but when I ask the question, because you've used the analogy of of, of marketing oh, I kind of know what the answer is but I'm going to keep okay. keep going with it anyway so we've done I, I was going to ask you about financing so um, uh, I think the reason why there are less acquisitions than let's say more activity around marketing yeah. for example is because of that problem I think if plenty of people were willing to lend it I think that there would be more so what are your thoughts around that topic Great question. That that's usually I, I would agree that's a, a sticking point for most people when they begin to consider something like this. And I can actually tell you, um, it can be quite simplistic in getting the resources right. And I go, I use it's it's almost cliche, but it's so true. It's not about having the resources, it's about being resourceful. Right. And I'll give several examples, right? You have different financing tools depending on the type of company that you're looking to acquire. SaaS companies, reoccurring models, something I particularly focus on and prefer to focus on, um, have tons of revenue models that will fund based on their annual reoccurring income. So let's say, okay, this company is generating this amount. We'll, you can use the company to fund capital for acquisition, right? That's one example. Right, and you can use tools like there's a company called Pipe, right, that will fund based on a company's annual reoccurring revenue, right? So I can go in and say, okay, this company's doing that. Pipe will say they'll do X amount in funding based on that company's revenue, and you just pay them back over X amount of time based on the cash flow of the business. It's one example, right? Other examples are for strategic mergers and so forth are saying, look, if we just do what's called a paper roll up right, which is we both, we create a new entity and we swap our shares for the newer entity, our multiple increases for an exit, right? So that's called a share swap, right? I didn't actually exchange capital, right? I just exchanged shares in a newer entity for us to get a larger buyout because now we're one larger entity. So companies buying, companies that acquire, right, will pay more for larger size companies, quote unquote. So that's a share swap example. Right. There are several others that we can look at. We can look at exchanging resources. Right. Hey, you know, let's let, let's say there's a smaller company doing 300 grand per year. He's a solopreneur. He's burnt out. He doesn't like focusing on fulfillment. Right. You can go to that guy, type of person and say, hey, look, we can help get you off fulfillment. Right. Help drive growth through these three or four ways. Right. Et cetera. And you can focus on the parts of the business that you love. Uh, we'd like, you know, 40 to 60% of the business to make that exchange of resources, right? Or help or support, et cetera. So you can exchange internal resources, right? Which is a form of capital. And most people don't think of it that way, but your expertise and the systems you've developed are capital, right? When we say capital, most people only think of finances. That's actually just one form of capital, right? Your relationships, your, you know, if you ever watch a, a TV show like Shark Tank, if you're familiar with it, right? You notice there's a couple areas that they negotiate. It's not just how much money they're putting in. They also incentivize these, these entrepreneurs to say, hey, you know, I'm a tech entrepreneur. You know, I'm Mark Cuban. I have these relationships 
that you get access to by becoming a partner with me. Relational capital, right? These are all things that you can begin to exchange, right? For access to their resources or equity, et cetera, right? So I would challenge all the listeners, right? Think about what you have in your wheelhouse that is of that you may not have thought about it, but is of huge value to even what looks like competitors, you know, peers in your industry, et cetera, right? Because those are things that probably some of your competitors are looking for. They're trying to solve that problem that you solve regularly and say, hey, look, we could cross sell with each other to drive growth. We could merge. There's a ton of things you could do there. Or they could just be burnt out, or here's my favorite, right? On how to drive acquisition opportunity, drive, you know, capital for it. Somebody who's, you know, as so as serial entrepreneurs, they probably got two or three other projects and they now want to go focus on instead of what they're doing now. You'd be surprised. You could also get what's known as seller financing, which is they'll say, Hey, I want this amount for the business. I want you to just pay me monthly installments for the business, right? Or it mix is, um... them pretty cool that um you can buy a business um and the the business actually pays for the fact that you bought that business it's that's crazy it. right that's it right you know and a lot of us might be familiar with how real estate investing works right the traditional ways hey typically you might get a loan and the tenant pays the mortgage plus a cash flow on top right after all expenses and to that point yes it could be that concept can be similar right? That business could be paying, right? Everything that's needed oftentimes for, for the, uh, the acquisition. You mentioned Shark Tank. And since we're on the topic of mergers and acquisitions, what do you think of the show? Uh, I love that show. That, and then I'm not sure if you've ever heard of the show called The Profit. Um, I haven't. With, oh, check it out. It, it's on, uh, if you're familiar with a streaming platform called Peacock, it's on there. Um, uh, one of my favorite entrepreneurs that I look up to a lot, his name is Mark Limonis. Um, he's a turnaround expert. So he goes into investing companies that are, you know, borderline insolvent or borderline failing, you know, good legacy businesses. Um, and he helps turn them around by, you know, optimizing their internal infrastructure and so forth. So that's probably one of my favorite entrepreneurial focus shows, um, along with, uh, Shark Tank. I will look into it. So I'm, I'm surprised that there's one out there that I don't know about, but um, oh, I like yeah. Shark Tank. I like uh, Dragon's Den, the UK version. Yeah. Um, and there's plenty of other good ones. But um, it makes me think about how, I know you told me like you were looking for a, should we say, mm -hmm. you were looking for leverage in order to get access to those companies that you wouldn't have otherwise done. But how mm -hmm. did you start implementing in terms of uh, getting into this area of expertise? Yeah, so... Um, so after I left, um, the transportation company, I went to become an insurance agent and so forth. Um, I was top performer there, but that's where I caught that entrepreneur bug. Um, and to kind of tie that into your question after that, my first attempt at becoming an entrepreneur was to buy a $7 million trucking company. Now, uh, I'm smiling because uh, I guess I was really bold, you know, like because I didn't exactly have a million dollars in the bank account uh, after leaving my job, right, to buy a $7 million company. Um, so what I did was I tried to go find a credit partner, right? Um, I searched through various Facebook groups um, of other acquisition groups, all this type of stuff to, to find someone else who, you know, who's already in that mindset, who's done a deal to try and bring them on to help me close this one because I had a background in logistics. So I had a growth opportunity. So um, it turns out though, that uh, the bank would not touch the deal because the business owner went through a non-compete and a divorce back to back and ran those expenses through the business. So the deal was unbankable because of that. So this is kind of really where, what, what kind of drove me to do what I do now. So in essence, you know, I wasn't able to fund it traditionally and I had to get creative. And this goes back to resourcefulness. So I wasn't able to produce a million dollars in cash for the transaction. But what I was able to do after looking at his financial infrastructure was to add $880,000 per year back to his net bottom line cash. It's just through a bit of financial reengineering, negotiating with vendors, um, restructuring how he had some of his debts and so forth. So in essence, I got creative 
and was able to add close to a million dollars in value, right, to this business. So that's kind of what really led to it. Like I, my mindset is that, you know, I, I believe, you know, 80, 20 rule, as they say, right. If we can focus on the thing that drives most of the results, then we amplify our inputs and outputs. Right. So I'm always looking for the most lean, effective way to do stuff. Right. Um, you know, so that's kind of what drove me down that path. Like, it, you know, I thought to buy a business before I thought to build one, right? Because it made sense to me personally that, hey, what if I could get access to systems that are already producing, right? That was kind of my mindset, what led me down that path, right? Um, so um, those are some things that kind of attributed to my kind of initial journey uh, to thinking that way was what's the lean, most effective way to get to where I wanted to be. And oftentimes, there's a more effective way or a better way than typically what we're aware of, if that makes sense. Perfect sense. Um, it does make me think about uh, the, the difference between, let's say, creating and growing a company, which is, I don't know, 7 million versus acquiring one. Um, I think most people you know, would, would choose the latter. But it makes me think about the question that what do you think about being in the company that you just acquired? And let's say your experience is maybe less than, it would be far less than if you grew it. So what do you think yeah. about being in that company as the owner? Great question. So uh, a few things, right? You can, um, there are partial acquisitions you could do. And I'll say that up front. And what I mean by that is you can acquire an equity stake with an owner that also wants to stay on. So less workload for you, right? But may, one thing you want to do, let's say in a scenario where, yes, you've become the new owner, the new operator of the business, if you will, you're going to want to ensure that SOPs are established from the previous owner. Um, and most owners don't do this for, you know, initially. So developing a skill set and being able to ask questions and walking them through the process to ensure things are documented is going to be key, right? Um, and these are things you can learn, right? I, I'm of the I'm of the mindset that the best way to learn is to dive in. So um, by no means were these all things that I just had together up front. It was out of necessity, and I was just open and willing to do what was necessary to expose myself to what was needed, like right? the needed information and so forth. But yeah, so uh, to answer your question, to be able to do that effectively, you're going to need documentation. You're going to need an open line of communication with the previous owner, right? Where in these agreements, you can negotiate, hey, I'd like you to provide me access to you, give me training, you know, from you. I can ask questions. I can give you a phone call a week or whatever the case is. So uh, I'm familiar with what needs to be done in particular situations, right? Um, so there's a lot of things you're, you're going to, uh, you can do to, you know, better prepare yourself to run the ship, if you will. Um, now there are other advanced strategies. One thing I love to do again, um, you know, is you could look for a strategic merger with another company in the area that's similar to the one you're, you know, you're acquiring. Why? Because the best way to find someone who's capable of running a business like yours is to find someone already running a business like yours, right? Um, so uh, again, we could solve the problem with, same philosophy, the resources or skill set that someone already has established. So in those examples, right, we can look for a company that is similar, that has an operator, right, and then negotiate a strategic partnership or merger, and they become the new CEO of the new larger entity is one is another strategy that we found, you know, successful. And worst case scenario, you could always look at potentially um, promoting someone who's been with the company for X amount of time. Right. Those are all ways to get around kind of that perceived lack of experience, perhaps, when coming into a company. Great answer. I think a, a lot of people, maybe who are who are watching, I think there's there's also going to be an interest in selling their business. So, yes. um, have you got any thoughts on maybe the key things that people need to do in order to make their business appealing to a buyer? Oh yes, that's just a great question. Um, I I want. Uh, I want everybody listening to start thinking of 
their company, of course, is arguably one of their greatest assets that they have, right? Throughout your entrepreneurial journey, even especially if you can do this even from the start of your business, the better, right? Don't just think about customer value, right? And that's where most of us are, especially in the early building stages, trying to get clients and what's important to them. That's very important. But I want you to think about shareholder value throughout your journey, even especially from the start. Why would somebody want to buy your business, right? Think about that. You know, are, are things more, if things can be more systemized, more organized, if your processes can become repeatable and predictable, these are all things that are a value of someone who might want to come in, right? So think about those things from the start. And if you haven't yet, that's okay. Think about it. Start thinking about it today, right? Because the majority of entrepreneurs who grew wealth did so through some form of acquisition and exit strategy, whether that's going public, you know, all the entrepreneurs we hear about, Elon Musk, whatever the case is, there, there was some form of liquidity event or exit that happened to get them to that point, right? So um, it, it's something that should be on every entrepreneur's mind, um, uh, but most of us get caught up in the day-to-day, -day, right? The in the business as opposed to being able to think on it strategically. Um, so think about ways to make your business, uh, to build redundancy in the business, build repeat, repeatable processes within the business, having growth plans for your business, right? These are all things that an, uh, a new acquirer is willing to pay a premium for, for businesses that are organized. So if you can get your things organized, get your numbers organized, get your p ls together, all of those things, have those ready, right? Um, and being able to source buyers is not as hard. Again, it goes back to sales. It's a sales and marketing process, right? So the other side of that is how do I, how the heck do I find somebody who wants to buy my business, right? It could be one of your competitors, one of your larger competitors. It could be, you know, one of the strategic partnerships that you've developed. Those are usually the easiest ones to source and act with, you know, a pending buyer through. People you're already making money with. Some of your vendors, right? You'd be surprised, right? Um, you know, just kind of, you know, personally putting the word out there, hey, I'm interested in an exit. You'd be surprised what might comes up, you know, from, from some of your already, you know, established partnerships. Um, Is that from experience? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Your current partnerships could be some of the fastest ways to source somebody interested in, in buying, right? You know, and it may not, and a lot of times it doesn't have to be someone who's in the framework of being in acquisitions. Just, you know what, hey, you know, my business has these or these things that are of value, especially if you have a relationship with them, you know what their pain points are. Say, I'm, I'm kind of open to considering some exits. Do you know anybody? You know what? I've been trying to fix this thing in my business and your business could be the solution. Like that happens all the time. Businesses will acquire other businesses just to fix something in their own operations all the time. Right. So, yeah, that network is, is key. You'd be surprised. You might have a few deals in your phone right now. <laughs> well, um, if that's the case, then let's take a, a few a few steps for people to perhaps um, get started on maybe an acquisition. What do you tell them? Yeah, I would say you know whether it's acquisition or just joint ventures, right? Uh, start to think. Here are some ways to think about what could be a great target. Uh, in terms of think about your in this moment, think about your end client right? Think about what they buy before doing business with you, instead of doing business with you, during business with you, or after. And those are some great ways to build, for lack of better terms, an ecosystem or supply chain of acquisitions, right? I'll use this example, right? Or for partnerships. Think of what a realtor does, which is help someone buy and sell a home. Think about some things that a home buyer is probably looking at or purchasing along with buying a home. Well, they need insurance, right? They're probably looking at furniture. They might be looking at home services like lawn care, right? Those are all things they're probably spending money on along with that home purchase. So you as a realtor could build strategic partnerships even with you know, furniture companies, et cetera, insurance companies, because I got to buy insurance for a home. All of these you know, lending, they need a mortgage, right? You could be building relationships with all these types of folks for A, to drive referral business, 
which is, in my opinion, the best business you could get. I mean, referred business closes faster, with less effort. They close it, you know, they convert a lot higher. So, you know, um, that's another thing I always tell people, if you want to grow effectively without needing to really scale internally, focus on driving, systematically driving referral business. But um, those are some big steps I would start with is use that framework to begin to identify growth opportunities, whether they are acquisitions or just partnerships to drive referrals. Start there. Any deals in the pipeline at the moment for you? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I do have a few. I have a, I do have a few. Um, I have a pending, uh, a few pending mergers and exits. Um, and I do have some additional acquisitions uh, pending on the table that I'm really excited about. So um, I, I can't stress enough if uh, it, as an entrepreneur, uh, I'd call that the next rung in the entrepreneur ladder, right? Is building a business so forth. But just really start thinking, what if you could grow by a whole company tomorrow? Just think about that, right? What if you could double your company with one transaction? Start thinking that way, you know? So, but yeah, I got a few things in the pipeline that I'm excited about, so. <laughs> well, I'd love to know, um, maybe uh, if you could get in touch when, when that happens, that'd be great, because I'd love to know that. Um, yeah, definitely. But is there anything that I should have asked you about today? Um, other than that, uh, my goal is always to, expand someone's imagination on what's possible for them right um you know you and i talk i'm a dad right you know so i got three kids and i'm always trying to find ways how can i build wealth while spending more time with my family so um that's my motivation and you know if there's anything that someone asks me to speak on it's uh, i'm always hoping to expand someone's imagination to think about what's really possible right if you can really you know just kind of challenge yourself to expand kind of that framework on how you think you'll be surprised on what's achievable so uh that'll be what i what i got on that so any uh any goals uh long-term goals that you've got yeah um short uh both short and long term um uh, i'm always looking to to grow the sizes of my transactions right um but my goal is to um, achieve a certain amount of earnings while working less than part-time. That's my goal, right? Because I wanna, uh, as much as I can, become more and more hands-on with family and just so forth. But, you know, uh, and that's kind of really, I would say my passion, you know, how can I build wealth to the level I wanna build it and not have to work 10 hours a day? <laughs> right? So what, one day, am I gonna see you on Shark Tank then? Is that what you're Perhaps. telling me? Perhaps it could be a possibility. You never know. You never know. So, but yeah, that's my goal is how can I, how can I build wealth while, uh, while truly, you know, as I put it, working less than part-time, best way to do that is focus on uh, swinging for the fences, right? So that's the goal. So if people want help with an acquisition um, and they want to talk to you, where do they go? Yeah. Great question. Um, uh, I love, you know, um, just uh, I love being social, right? I'm on LinkedIn in particular. Um, if you'd like help with whether that's acquisitions, even just a growth strategy through driving partnerships, right, is a great place to start, right, to get your feet wet, uh, wet. But if you want help with any business development, you know, or coaching, that sort of thing along those lines, you can reach out to me directly on LinkedIn. Um, I do have a custom LinkedIn URL, um, Khalil, you know, linkedin.com slash in slash ready for growth now. Um, so you could type that in to find me or just search my name, Khalil F. Stoltz. Um, reach out and connect directly. Um, I manage my own LinkedIn, um, so I'll, I'll answer and respond, right? So uh, reach out, connect, say, hey, look, I'm interested in learning how to grow more effectively um, and we can have a conversation. Well, for everyone listening or watching, leave you the link in the description. And Khalil, thank you for being a great guest today. Hey, thanks, Thomas. Thanks for having me.